All right. Hello, everybody. Whoa, that's, that's quite an echo. Got some reverb here. All right. Um, anybody in the back? I encourage anybody to come closer. This will be a more of an intimate conversation, a little bit of a Q&A. Or you can just stay right there. That's all. That's what says intimate conversation like your microphone. Right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on our session today. This will be a panel session uh, with a bit of a Q&A here. Uh, we're talking about discoveries for scale. So preparing for that brand and platform makeover that you guys are probably looking at right now or, or planning on. Um, let's, uh, let's see if I can get my screen to work. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Dichter. I am the Creative Director for North America at FFW. Uh, I've been um, leading all sorts of uh, projects and endeavors in the digital space for over 20 years, been with FFW for seven years. Um, we have an exciting set of topics today all around discoveries. Um, today we're going to cover a few different topics. It can be a very loose format, uh, but essentially we want to talk about why do a discovery in the first place. We want to talk about the impact of various business decisions and what they have on your various digital channels and also vice versa. Uh, we're planning on talking about how we can understand the impact of all these decisions on your experience on the design and on the technology. And then we also want to talk about uh, you know, common challenges that come up during discovery, challenges with vendors, challenges with your organizations or your business, and kind of everything in between. Uh, I have a very talented and smart group of people who are joining me today. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and, well, why don't you guys introduce yourselves, actually, make sure the microphones are working. Oh, yeah. There okay. I go. Amanda? I think it's on. Can we, is it on? Okay, great. Um, I'm Amanda Kanopko. I am the director of the experience design team here at FFW. I've been with FFW for about 10 years, and I have 14 ish years of experience in the industry um, building results driven websites platforms put that in between us there hi i'm cheney kurunyotis uh, i'm the director of client success at ffw i've been with the company about four years now um, but before i worked here i was a client so most of my background is in marketing and communications in the higher ed and nonprofit space um, so I was, uh, I was uh, on the, the receiving end um, of FFW's good work uh, at Stanford when I was a communications director there. Uh, and so, yeah, today we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about um, how to bring your stakeholders together for discoveries, how to get that buy-in and kick the project off um, with everything that it needs to be successful when you're considering how to move through um, a replatform or redesign at scale. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Norse. I work at Penn State University. I am the director for Web and Digital. Is that me? Uh, Web and Digital Strategy. <laughs> uh, so my background a little bit is I've come. I'm, uh, I'm a web software developer by background, but the last seven years or so, been sort of moving incrementally in the space towards marketing and digital strategy. So I have sort of an IT platform, uh, build, scale, uh, QA, low defects sort of back uh, mentality that I now am bringing to bear in service of a philosophy that marketing owns uh, a brand's top level website. So I'm uh, Nathan Plowman. I'm a solutions architect at FFW. I've been with FFW for about nine years now. I've been working in the Drupal space for about 12 years. Um, yeah, great. Excited to be here. <laughs> uh, now we'll just go around the, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, all right, but I did have a question for this group before we get to the panel, uh, and that is, just by a show of hands, how many people here have actually gone through a discovery in the last three months, let's say? All right. How about in the last six months? All right, in the last year? All right, so everybody has probably gone through this. So we're going to bring up a lot of things here, probably common pain points that you guys have experienced or other challenges. Uh, and again, encouraging this to be an open conversation here so uh, we can answer your questions directly as well. So you know, as soon as you have a question or something that you want to bring to light, feel free to shoot up your hand and we'll, uh, we'll address it as soon as we can. Um, but really quickly, uh, just to set this up, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that happen within organizations and businesses that's going to require some sort of project or new engagement. Right? We see this with either 
rebrands or perhaps acquisitions or other business decisions that are making significant impacts on how the brands need to adjust their platforms in the future. Um, you know, this also has to do with the evolving demands, not just of the organization, but of your customers as well. Um, so in this panel, we want to talk about the challenges and impacts of those decisions from branding and visual identity to the information architecture, content modeling, and the adoption of new technologies and systems uh, that usually become involved. Uh, so the uh, first question that I want to ask uh, to the group uh, is really kind of why do we do uh, discoveries in the first place? And it really gets to usually, uh, you know, why this project or engagement overall. So uh, let me kind of turn to the panel really quickly, and I'll start with Chaney, who talks to a lot of our clients. So, you know, why are we doing discoveries in the first place? Well, it's, it, that is a question we often uh, have to answer uh, for our clients, especially as we're starting out with these engagements. I bet many of you who have run these projects or discoveries in the past um, have come up against a stakeholder who says, why are we wasting time at the beginning asking all these questions? I already know what my problems are. I already know my customers. I know my constituents. I know what I want to get done. Here's a list of things I'd like you to change. Why are we going to sit around and talk about it for a few weeks first? Um, and typically, some of the answers that we return back um, to, to clients we work with who are in this kind of space is really in thinking about uh, how the website is supporting your organizational goals. Right? We have often found that um, it's, it's critical and, and rarely carried out to draw a very clear, a very bright line between what your organization is trying to achieve and what you're trying to achieve with your website. Um, sometimes that doesn't often get done. My favorite question to ask at the beginning of any discovery in one of our very first workshops, we've gathered all of our important stakeholders together. They're ready to give us their best thinking on this topic. And the first question I'd like to ask is, why do you have a website? <laughs> and the room does that. Um, and then we start to be able to have a more thoughtful conversation that is a little bit less about this thing is broken, that thing doesn't work the way I want it to, um, and these are the things I want to do with the site and I can't, although those are a critical part of the conversation. But we start at a much more fundamental level of like, how should the site support your organizational goals? Is it doing that now? If not, how can we get it to that point? And that serves as a guiding principle for all of the work that gets done in the project beyond. We find that incredibly helpful, especially for really large scale projects, because you're gonna get into the weeds. You're gonna get into minutia. You're gonna start having conversations with stakeholders about how look, things look this way or that way, or this experience or that experience, or I know what my customers want, but maybe the research says something different. Um, and you need to have that, that guiding light that comes back to you saying, how should the website support your mission, your organizational mission? And how does that break out into specific objectives, goals, a design that's user-centric? So for us, it really comes down, again, to that question of why. Why do you need this? Why are you doing it? And then we can start talking about what needs to be done to get you to the desired end result, which is not a nice website that does cool things, but a tool that supports your organizational mission and goals over the long term. And I, I think that, you know, when we know the ultimate goal of the project and what is trying to be achieved in that, that why statement, we can then, as practitioners, be able to put our focus in what's important. And also discoveries help us to uncover the gotchas mm -hmm. before we get into the phase where we have to move quickly most of the time and we have to get things right the first time. So it's, it's good to be able to you know, spend some time really digging into areas that are important for the project, mm -hmm. as well as uncovering some of those, those things that could come up in a later stage and kind of give upheaval to the project. Um, and getting those things into a known area instead of being unknowns is always good. I also I, I totally agree. I also think just the, the, the ritual, the ceremony of a discovery we're finding is I'm accustomed now to working at folks that are sort of my level and up, and you hear different stories. And it's a, it's a ceremony where you can get executive leaders and folks that are sort of the building blocks, the tactical players who really own and operate the website in the same ritual and hear them say, their perspective. So for, like, for one instance, uh, there's an editor wants, they want, what do, you, what do you need? You need a great authoring experience. 
uh, has all the has all my widgets. It has all the, the workflow baked into it. Where you can have an, a, an executive say, well, what I want is a digital ecosystem that's going to allow me to get measurement reports where I can predict what my you know, prospective students are going to do before they've done it. And right now, all I can do is sort of have reports that tell me what has already happened. And they're talking about the same project, but the perspectives are so radically different. The discovery allows a synthesis uh, to happen sort of for one of the first times, and you get much, much, much better uh, product. Anything, anything to add, Nate, <laughs> as we're going down the road? <laughs> oh, no, that's great, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was uh, something that Cheney said I, I really, really liked of, you know, sometimes you'll come into the room and uh, there's a lot of focus on kind of, you know, what the current state is and that kind of, I think, colors or can limit what, you know, if you're doing a, a new site build or redesign or something, a lot of times that can kind of limit or restrict the vision for uh, what the new project can be or should be. And yeah, I think kind of having that design, or sorry, the discovery kind of focused on, you know, why do you have that, the website in the first place? What are your goals? How is this helping you achieve those goals can kind of uh, help guide the project in a more constructive way instead of just playing whack-a-mole of trying to fix, you know, the problems that exist in your website today. And it's like, maybe it's like if you're moving from a different platform to Drupal or from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, a lot of those problems might just go away anyway. And that's not really necessarily getting you closer to those big picture goals. Yeah, it takes you out of the reactive mm -hmm. mode right. that yeah. sometimes you're in when you start a project. Yeah. Right, yes. right. A, a list of pain points is not a, a strategy for, yeah. for mm -hmm. <laughs> updating and, your website. And I think that's the interesting thing that kind of tie this all together is that, you know, when we start a project, um, we don't assume that there is consensus yeah. on the stakeholder <laughs> side. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think what we're endeavoring to do during our discoveries is to achieve some place where we do have some consensus. So even that editor or otherwise, whoever is contributing to this project or has dependencies or requirements for this project, you know, has that, their voice heard, mm -hmm. essentially, right? So they understand that even if we weren't able to check all the boxes and deliver all the different features and requirements, they at least had a hand in the conversation. They at least, you know, were able to contribute and probably maybe hearing the news that maybe that particular requirement or feature, you know, wasn't able to happen maybe a first phase, but can happen later, makes it just more appealing to them is part of the process versus having a requirements or a decision or recommendation forced down upon them without them being able to contribute at that's, all. I think that's an ad, that's a that's a really important point I think to pull out. The other the other purpose of discoveries that I think rarely gets um, articulated but ends up often being the most influential and most powerful piece of it to set the project up for success. Um, it goes back also to what Amanda was saying about finding gotchas, but there's, that's not just technical ones, it's the people ones. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, the, the, the discovery we usually um, tell our clients outright is not just an opportunity for us to learn about you and your needs, but for your stakeholders to have a chance to learn about the project, voice their opinions, their concerns, be heard, and give you a chance to build buy-in. Because that is the stage at which you have the opportunity to head off problems from mm -hmm. stakeholders who might feel concerned about the project, maybe they're worried that a change is going to take away something that's very important to them, or they just don't know what to expect and they're very nervous, frustrated, intimidated by this. Like, I have found so many times um, when projects like this stall, it's rarely because of a strictly budgetary problem or a technology problem, it's usually because of a people problem. Mm -hmm. um, and a discovery well executed gives you an opportunity not only to learn the details of the current state of the site, the scope of the work you're doing, the goals of the organization, but also a chance to educate the stakeholders and give them a chance um, to participate in a way that will potentially smooth problems out for you down the road. Um, all right. So um, with these discoveries, we've been speaking very generally, but what what makes up a discovery? What type of activities you know are we doing? And maybe we can take it by service line. I don't know, Cheney, <laughs> if you want to kind of start with some of the overarching stuff that we tend to do, but yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, uh, so at FFW, we always like to start, like we said, by having conversations, right? So we are typically starting with collaborative workshops. Um, many of these are, are design oriented. Sometimes they are technology oriented, depending on the, the needs of the project. Um, we usually begin with um, what we call a goals and challenges workshop, that sort of high level um, engagement. But um, it's an opportunity first to speak with stakeholders um, to get their picture um, of concerns and goals. 
Um, at the same time, we're probably gonna be conducting some audits of the site from both a UX design perspective as well as a technical perspective. Um, and then moving into uh, some different types of exercises depending on the way the discovery is put together. Perhaps there's UX research involved. Um, some of the work starts to move more closely from that phase um, into the experience design phase, which Ann Amanda, maybe you wanna dig a little bit into what, um, what XD typically does in a discovery. Yeah, so XD is normally focused on um, content design and then any sort of user research. So we'll start with user research to get a baseline of what users' wants and needs are so that we can then align that with the business needs and really try and achieve um, understanding that user journey. We will run some workshops in order to understand the audiences, understand the user journey overall, um, as well as do content inventories, design system inventories to understand the system that we're currently working with. And then we run workshops to kind of facilitate our understanding, make sure that there's nothing that we don't know, um, because if you're doing an audit, you usually don't know everything. Um, so we, we run a lot of sessions in that way of, it's more of knowledge gathering, it's more of gaining alignment on the system and kind of uncovering some of the, the, the things that need to get updated based on kind of that project purpose and the goals um, for the business and the users overall. Yeah. If we're doing analytics, there's gonna be measurement planning at that yep. stage, understanding what we're gonna to measure to, to help ensure the site is successfully carrying out your goals for you. And then on the technical side, yeah, yeah, on the technical side, I would say, I don't know if I've done a discovery where I've done the same set of workshops twice on different projects, just mm -hmm. because, um, you know, projects can be so different, just depending, you know, are you doing a Greenfield brand new site build? Are you migrating an existing site, like doing like a Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 upgrade? Um, or are you working on an existing site and just enhancing it with new features, things like that? So just depending on the nature of the project, the kinds of activities I do on the technical side for discovery are gonna be different. Um, but you know, in cases like where if I'm doing like a migration or working on an existing um, uh, site, one of the first things we'll usually start with are kind of doing technical audits, just trying to understand uh, the current code base, how the site's built, um, can understand the content model of the existing site so we can kind of start thinking through uh, strategies for uh, migration, um, how, you know, things need to move over from a leg legacy site to the new site, how's that all gonna work? And it, it, for me, it's, it's really kind of working backwards of like, you know, once we get to the end of discovery, you know, we're gonna need to have certain things, like we'll need to have a feature matrix that we like kind of understand, you know, these are all the features that need to be part of the platform build. You know, I'll wanna have a, a, at least a high level of implementation plan of like, okay, this is how we're going to approach doing the build from a technical perspective. Um, so it's really kind of just starting from like, this is where we want to be by the time we get to the end of discovery and kind of working back there and kind of thinking through what questions do we need to ask in order to get there. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so it kind of starts with that audit and then a lot of times it's uh, working with different stakeholders, kind of walking through the questions of like, okay, maybe we need to figure out, um, you know, our content editorial approach. And you know, from a Drupalist point of view, I'm like, okay, we're gonna choose layout paragraphs or layout builder. The client might not necessarily have the context to know what that means. So it's kind of more like, okay, what things might push me towards one recommendation versus the other and kind of finding a way to uh, ask those questions in a way that's appropriate for your core stakeholder group. Excellent, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, so that kind of gets to my next question. You kind of answered it. So, you know, you guys talk about this as a very formal process. I assume it's just one size fits all, right? <laughs> zero percent. Yeah, okay, zero percent. <laughs> yeah, so obviously we, we have to adjust the discoveries uh, for the engagement and the project we're working on. Sometimes we'll always rely on the same few workshops and sometimes we have to create a whole new workshop, net new, because we have a whole new set of requirements or piece of information uh, that we're trying to understand. But overall, as we kind of covered here, uh, you know, our discovery activities are generally, you know, a whole load of workshops from goals and challenges to talk about audiences and journey mapping, uh, focusing on branding and design, ones that focus on content, and ones that focus on technical requirements as well as data analytics and measurement plans. Um, we also do a variety of audits across the system. Content audits, accessibility audits was actually gonna be a big thing. I don't know if you guys saw, 
uh, that the um, there was uh, new regulations about when everyone needs to be accessible. Um, I don't have the exact date, but that literally just dropped right before the session. In July 26. There you go. Yeah. Um, uh, current state uh, behavior analytics, uh, that's something that's important to look at during discoveries. Uh, we also tend to do uh, UX research, so sometimes getting access to your audience or customers uh, to start to baseline the experiences with them. Uh, we'll often uh, start to work at the end of our discoveries on things like strategic road mapping and recommendations, and as Nathan alluded to earlier, creating a feature matrix. So at the end of discovery, we are well on our way to having a solid plan for implementing whatever we want. Matt, if I can just jump in yeah. at the end of that. So if you're thinking about what types of activities you might want to include in a discovery that you may be running internally, really the way we make those decisions, that you know, we just gave a very long list of potential activities to carry out, right? So the, the, the way we think about making decisions for that is, again, it comes down to like the why. What are you trying to get to at the end point there, and what do you need to know in order to carry out the project successfully? So when we're thinking about which types of workshops and audits might be most appropriate for a project, what type of UX research or other types of um, analyses are gonna be useful. Um, it comes back a around to what information do we need to get in order to successfully carry out the goals of the project. So that's um, a, a helpful rubric, I think, in thinking about what types of um, activities might be most useful is you know, what questions are you gonna need to ask your stakeholders in order to give them what they're asking for. Um, and that's a good a good framework for shaping your own discovery activities. Yeah, because I think a lot of this ultimately is an exercise in change management as well. Mm -hmm. Like we and you all are probably asking your clients or your organizations to go through like a significant process and significant change. And how are you going to manage that, especially when you may have some stakeholders who are actually resistant to that? Uh, we we often hear a lot of pushback when we want to do uh, discoveries. Uh, Sometimes it's, oh, well, we already know the issues that we are experiencing, our customers are experiencing. Other times it's, oh, well, we already, we already did the research. We have, we have some research. We can share that with you. Or we already did our own discovery. Or we already made you know, this deliverable, that deliverable that you talk about. And you know, I think that's all appropriate pushback. And it's great to have that conversation. Um, when we approach our discoveries, we tend and try not to dismiss any of the past work that's happened before. Our, our intent is to actually build on it. So one of the things that we'll usually do before discoveries is a material intake period where we're evaluating all these things that they may have produced. Because sometimes a marketing team that has produced a persona isn't exactly the type of persona that we might need from a UX perspective when we're trying to do journey maps or jobs to be done. Uh, but I'm curious from this group, what are, what are some other like pushbacks that you've heard like in terms of you know, doing discoveries or otherwise? Hmm. Staring at each other. Uh, time frame is, is one often, right? Mm -hmm. I think to your point, like um, typically with a lot of clients, by the time they get to the, the point of having come to internal consensus on carrying out a project that's typically of a pretty significant size and they're ready to move forward, they've probably been wrangling on this topic internally for months, maybe years um, to get to this point, and they are ready to go. And they don't want to have any more conversations about it because they've been having internal conversations about it for a long time. <laughs> Jim, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. I feel like I'm speaking on, I'm right. speaking on your behalf. So you now. just you teed it up. So <laughs> I think that, like, I, I'm the, I, I don't work at FFW, I work at Penn State. Uh, and so, but it's, and we're doing a discovery engagement with them, with them now on an important project. But there were years, years building to this moment. I don't know what we would call it. Is it, pre-discovery, is it business planning, is it visioning, it's inside salesmanship, there's decks upon decks upon decks, there's, you know, getting into the room with a VP here and there, and the president, and come, you know, you got five minutes, gotta have that pitch. Before you get the funding for your vision to then go to market with an RFP and start to explain to your stakeholders what uh, discovery is. And so by that moment, you know, at Penn State, we're, you know, we're nonprofit, but we're a $9 billion um, annual revenue nonprofit. We're big, highly decentralized. Uh, if you're thinking about like a logical roadmap of how we should be handling uh, modernization of web, it should be, okay, let's just do it a central design system. Let's get the 100 different web teams to adapt the design system so it looks like Penn State. We, we don't have time for that. So we're going, we're, we're doing it asynchronously. 
uh, like vertical by vertical. We did news storytelling, brand storytelling, decoupled end to end, uh, governance, 250 authors doing one content type, true content sharing. Okay, got a win on that. And now it's we're doing it for the prospecting business. And uh, again, end to end, mock composable. But it's like there's, there's competing interest in the university. There's the uni university admissions, there's student financial aid, there's the registrar, there's the bursar, burst, did I pronounce it right, bursar, bursar. There's strategic communications and marketing. There's, other, there's our world campus, which is our online only. There's our eight, 19 Commonwealth campuses. Their point of view might feel something like, if this were such an obvious thing to be doing, Jim, you would have done it, someone would have done this 20 years ago. They don't, like, they, tried. they don't believe you. Um, and so the discovery process has been, again, a ceremony to build credibility. And for me, honestly, to finally, after years of grinding to this moment, is to shut up <laughs> and let the discovery process invite all of my stakeholders to see themselves in the work. And that's what's happening. So when I'm on these discovery calls, and I think I've been on what, how many hours, 30? 40. 40. <laughs> the best calls, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long. The best, the best discovery sessions are the ones where I'm not saying anything mm. except sort of thank you. Um, <laughs> because now my, you know, my AVPs and my VPs and my, you know, my, my web builders and admissions and student, they now, it's their project. And you've activated these stakeholders. And so that's what it feels like on the client side when it goes well. I think being able to have a third party yeah. sometimes to, to do that mm -hmm. is helpful, yeah. especially when you have so many stakeholders in kind of so many different departments that yeah. all have different needs and all feel like they're slightly at yeah. odds. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I appreciated, Cheney, you, you mentioning that because, you know, if it's, this process is going well, I'm allegedly good at something. I mean, but I, I, I don't... I don't need, I shouldn't have to be good at discoveries. This is sort of, it's the sort of value add that an agency can bring while the, my team is doing more st of standard work. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, we, we've, we've sometimes described to clients that doing workshops, especially the early ones like goals and challenges, is like us, you know, kind of moderating some group therapy oh, yeah. for, the, for the business, <laughs> essentially. Well, you know, it's sure. a safe space. You know, everyone <laughs> can say what they need to say. Um, yeah. But in other cases, I've also noticed that we've had to take different tacks when we have like misalignment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll even break stakeholders up into individual groups, maybe representing business units or other parts of an organization. So we can have a more discreet conversation because sometimes you don't want to share it. With I'm, the thinking, whole group. I'm thinking about the same client right now that you're thinking <laughs> about. And I, as an extreme example, we, we once worked with a client um, for whom uh, group, large, large group workshops were not feasible because the internal political atmosphere was so toxic <laughs> that it was not psychologically safe for them to even say things like, what is the goal of our website? Because there would be, because there would be disagreement as to what the answer was. And so in, in, you know, in cases like that, we find other ways to, in, to get that information and to engage. Smaller groups, as Matt said, surveys um, can be very helpful. Um, uh, coming up with, like, again, as a neutral third party, some of our own ideas about what those answers might be and giving them a chance to kind of review and right. gut check them or fact check them. Um, but it, it really is critical, I think, to, to Jim's point. Um, discoveries are so people-oriented. Um, and it really is critical to be able to understand and work with the cultural dynamics um, of the organization in which you're functioning, because that really can um, set the tone for a successful project or for one where you face a lot of obstacles, pushback, frustration, and so on. And so it's important to be able to adapt your tactics and approaches to the reality of the situation. I mean, it's really great when people get to come together and like, you know, everyone agrees on, on the grand and glorious future of the site and the organization, but functioning in the real world, you know, there's political undercurrents and, and that often gets reflected in these projects. My coworkers have heard me say this before. I like to say, um, like these types of projects are like weddings. They're very expensive. Uh, they're very logistically complicated and everybody has feelings about how you should carry it out. And really with websites in a lot of cases, it's similar to sort of like when you're at a wedding and someone's like, how dare you seat me back here with the, with the other losers at that table? Like that's, you know, that's low status, right? The website version of that is what do you mean I'm not on the top nav? 
What do you mean yeah. my department is? <laughs> what do you mean I'm below the fold? What do you mean my department's not in the drop down? I'm not on the homepage. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm not sitting next the to this guy. Homepage, yeah. right? You're not in the footer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's tough. Like it sounds. It, it's you know we've all had stories like that. It sounds kind of funny. It's kind of silly, but it really does. It is very meaningful for stakeholders who feel like they're sort of relative like status, position, the importance of the work that they're doing at your organization is reflected in the decisions that get made on the site. And that is why you will get pretty severe, like sometimes quite emotional pushback on these topics. And discovery is the right place to carefully and gently address those in a way that makes people feel heard and included. Um. Yeah, great. Um, so we've talked about some pushback, also some common challenges that we've experienced. Uh, Jim, I'm curious though, um, what challenges do you feel like you faced with working with agencies in terms of dis discoveries? We're sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, we need to some real time feedback. We'll, we'll just yeah. assume you're talking about another agency, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> Um, well, the point of view change is the, the point of view is different, of course, agency mm -hmm. to agency. I do think there is something uh, about having folks that have a battle tested point of view. Um, there's something to be said for a thoughtful process and knowing you've done this a hundred times. I think, uh, I think discoveries for other agencies, I've seen it be much more user testing focused and that what I found is an incredible part but before we even teed that up there was a, there was a much deeper richer you know goal setting what is your website about so I think uh, and then the process of some of the deliverables that we've seen uh, pretty impressive you know we're doing a site migration thousands of pieces of content and ultimately it's shocking I think for stakeholders to be presented with a list an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> there was a kill at it. Kill fruit. Yeah. You know. Keep kill evolve. Yeah. Uh, keep model. kill evolve. Yeah. Keep kill evolve. Thank you. And you know, it, do you want me to write a disposition on each of these things? Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we do. So I, I don't. I, I don't think I want to compare as much as say yeah. uh, that the model works when we're talking about brand brand level work mm -hmm. that is highest visibility that's you know it's 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 the brand tied to our revenue streams it's putting butts in seats it could be the difference between you know one of our combo campuses you know stagnating or growing like it's mission critical work um so yeah done. no thank you yeah that's that's helpful i do think there is a key challenge that we often face as an agency going into discoveries is that we are going to ask a lot of questions that maybe our stakeholders that have answered these questions before, it's in documentation, and we're asking those same questions kind of over and over. And I feel like that sometimes is a little bit challenging to get buy-in to help us understand as much as we need to without kind of pushing buttons of, well, I answered that and it's in this documentation. There's always a reason why we ask the question again and it's just to make sure that we're yeah. getting the, the small tidbits that we feel are missing. But sometimes that can get a little bit testy, I would say. So that's a challenge that, that we often sure. face is how do we deal with right. asking those questions but not pushing buttons at the same time. So it's, it's really interesting because, you know, one of the things I find is this fatigue from the client, yeah. like well, the client's like, well, we already know, we already know all these things, right? But okay. we're the agency, we're the vendors, like, well, we need to understand these things. So. I can give a short answer now that I've given a bit more thought. I've seen discoveries where, you know, in the, in the measure twice, cut once world, I've seen discoveries that have led to inaccurate estimates. And we have had to go back to a dry well to finish projects. Mm -hmm. Well, and that can't always happen, and uh, so there's something of something about getting the estimate right and putting the yeah. time in to the. That's that's our that's really the true value. Well, I mean, that's a perfect segue to one of my questions in here because sometimes we do learn things during discovery uh, that do impact the scope, and sometimes it's really awkward to be only like a week into a project and have to be like, oh, by the way. Uh, so um, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in here about how we've tried to mitigate in the past, how we manage 
that conversation at all. <laughs> I feel like I'm looking at Nathan for <laughs> Cause, oh. cause those, Well, those are, I feel like, a lot of the ones we get, um, the, like the gotchas that you two were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, and a lot of them are suddenly like, oh, oh, this integration that we didn't mention up front, or, or in some cases, working with a site that's of, of long-standing mm -hmm. enough legacy that the current stakeholder group didn't build or put together how it's built, and you sort of open the hood and you go, oh, God. That's, yeah. that's not what we expected to no. see at all. Yeah, no, it's like you have to be, uh, I think, flexible with discoveries. A lot of times we'll already kind of have like a general outline or, you know, kind of like here's what our uh, <laughs> uh, menu of discovery workshops is going to be kind of at the sales process before like anything is, is signed. Um, uh, but yeah, like I was on a project recently where I think at the sales process we kind of assumed this was going to be a typical, you know, Drupal build kind of greenfield thing as we got in. It's like, oh, no, we actually have a requirement we have to kind of use like this pre-built like, you know, um, uh, Drupal profile. We don't have the ability to add new content types to it. We have pretty limited ability to customize themes. This is a completely different project than what we thought it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we kind of had to, you know, pivot and it's like, okay, well, our workshops are going to look a little bit different now. Um, and, you know, th th that's fine. Like change orders exist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just, I think you kind of have to just, you know, uh, be checking and it's like, hey, maybe we need to pause and, you know, kind of rework this a little bit. Because um, I've been on times where it's just like, well, this is what was in the SOW, this is what we're going to deliver, and we just plow through. And it's like, th this doesn't make sense anymore. We, we really need to kind of, you know, reevaluate this and adjust our workshop to kind of fit the project that we now know that we're working on. Yeah. And I do think that we leave some of our workshops more open ended. So we'll call one of them a content and information architecture workshop. What is that going to entail? Well, my content inventory is gonna tell me what that entails. So we try and leave some of our things a little bit more open-ended so that yes, we're gonna do that every time, but it's gonna look different every time as Nathan had mentioned in the beginning where yeah. it's, you kind of work backwards of like, what is the end goal of, of what I need to achieve? And then also, what are the types of things that I'm finding that need to be more of a priority to dig into? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of times on our contracts, it'll say technical workshops, two to three sessions, yeah. and I'm writing the agenda for that during the goals and challenges workshop as I'm hearing yeah. things. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's like it kind of changes based off of what we learn in the, in the first sessions. Yeah. And I think they do help with scope of the next portion of the project mm -hmm. because throughout the discovery, you're learning, you're aligning, and those things that are coming up that could change the scope, everyone is kind of in the room on board mm -hmm. with why that thing is valuable, why we mm -hmm. need to include it, so that it's let, you don't have to get as much buy-in from some of the stakeholders who are on the project um, that you may have if you didn't do a discovery. Mm -hmm. The following has happened to me recently and I just want to share it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Californian. I've been in therapy for years, and I'm, <laughs> I'll tell the whole room. Some of these discovery sessions do have a feeling of therapy session. Oh, for mm -hmm. sure. And I've witnessed the following thing happen among my stakeholders where it's, you know, we're an hour and a half into a two-hour session, and it's, it's clicking. And people are, they're confessing. One person, you know, I had one person, <laughs> one person said, I'm gonna cry. And, you know, someone, it's often Amanda will say, we need to do another one of these. Like, yeah. we're, we're over the target now. You know, and that means we're gonna pay money for it, but it's worth it. Because, like, to unlock that emotional power and get people talking, I mean, that is everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it comes back to how the, the vision for this tool connects to yep. the work that you do and the vision for your organization, right? That stuff really matters and it's what drives the successful completion of these projects. Yeah. So, and I think that, you know, the way we ultimately will mitigate, you know, all these challenges is, is really twofold. It's expectation setting and then resetting those expectations. <laughs> and, and it's just, and it's the planning, which yeah. is why I think discoveries are ultimately so important. Um, to transparency. Um, yeah, absolutely. Transparency as well. Like Amanda was saying, and. Nathan as well, like, you know, sometimes we'll just know that we have a set of workshops that we want to do and are just going to be, you know, a little bit more vague up front as to what we're going to populate those workshops with and make those decisions as we go, because that's the type of project it demands. But other times, you know, we have, you know, somebody in procurement who needs a very itemized list of all the activities, what we're going to do and all the agendas, and we're kind of like locked in. So kind of trying to best deal with that, you know, can be a challenge sometimes. But the other thing I think that we do really well is that um, we don't 
again, as I was saying before, it's not a one size discovery, one size fits all discovery process for us. Sometimes even discoveries are their own independent projects entirely, right? So sometimes we will do discoveries as part of a larger complete scope for a whole, you know, discovery design build. And other times we are just doing the discovery to help the client or the organization understand the commitment they need to make for, you know, kind of yes. rebuilding that DXP that they're creating. Sometimes we propose that to a client who comes to us asking for the whole thing, but they don't know enough about their own requirements, capabilities, processes, and needs to be able to make a decision that soon. And sometimes we'll come back and say, you yeah. know what, why don't we just do the discovery first, see what we find, and then let's talk about what the project looks like. Yeah. That, that one page RFP is usually yeah. a tell that they don't <laughs> yeah. know what they need yet. It kills me to say it as a, you know, recovering, software developer, but you know, now I'm mostly, my value probably is as like an, as a salesperson. And so having the discovery, any discovery, I'm not talking about your, just any discovery, it does help me as a, it's a prop that I can leverage yep. mm -hmm. in my internal discussions with leaders and uh, people who own budget to you know unlock that budget for the next project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, I file it, you call it discovery to me, it's business case development. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. 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 And we've often seen our own clients take our discovery outcomes reports mm -hmm. and use those as a way to kind of you know acquire the the budgets for the yeah. project that and that can that can again be helpful in breaking sort of internal log jams especially if you have um, different groups in the organization who have different priorities different agendas or even different understandings I'm sorry understandings of reality um, third-party discovery findings UX research in particular can be quite powerful we had one client who um, had a, uh, several different business units that you know had different understandings um, of what their website was best used for and who came to it and how and why. And they really were thinking in terms of like the personas of their different customers across their different business units. And those personas were indeed very different and, and were quite unique in sort of who they were. But what we found in our research was that they all came to the site to do more or less the same thing. And so then we could orient the site around the tasks they wanted to carry out rather than who they were as individuals. And that, that project, which had been a standalone research project, in, helped inform their decision making and it helped break through uh, some, some impasses that had existed between the different departments as to how to prioritize the work, what to focus on, what the future site should look like, because they, you said you're bringing the receipts, yep. essentially. Yep. And that can be very, very powerful if you're stuck on what the vision for the future product should be. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can be successful within discoveries uh, themselves. Um, so what types of things do we do ahead of time to ensure success that in these, you know, we're asking people to spend a lot of time with us, right, Jim? How many hours have you I said? Mean, <laughs> massive amounts. Right, so like, what are we doing to make sure that people feel like their time is valued and that we're prepared and they can be prepared for the conversations? Amanda? Mm -hmm. So, we often start off with a workshop orientation and just making sure that all of our stakeholders who are going to be participating understand what we're trying to achieve in each workshop. Mm -hmm. Because if you get into the room and you start asking questions and everyone is like, I didn't know you were gonna ask me this, I can't answer this today, it kind of holds up the, the flow of conversation. <laughs> so getting people kind of in advance what we expect and getting them some sample questions of what we're going to be asking is something that we try and do for every discovery, as well as we have um, some time for materials intake. We try and do all of our inventorying up front before we have those conversations so that when we're coming into the workshops or the sessions, we are coming with value. So it's not just you know asking questions that are open-ended it's there is a specific reason why we are asking that question we can bring the data um, to kind of back it up as well so you're you probably experienced that orientation to discovery once in a project i'm telling you i experience it like twice a week because you're always there's new penn state faces popping up like who is that <laughs> because what i'm doing because when the, the successful discovery is people are saying to each other you this is real you should get in this the thing gets forwarded I'm doing, you're, you've, trained, you're, you've trained the trainers because I'm doing that orientation internally yeah. mm -hmm. for each new you know, cast of characters that's yeah. coming to the ship. So that's just, that's a good prop. That's just a, I mean, so maybe having a, 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 a slightly useful product owner is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah but I, again, I think 
gets back to the expectation setting, right? You're asking people of their time. This is not part of their day-to-day -day role to begin with. You're trying to steal time out of their day. So how do you make sure that they're best prepared and they feel that they can contribute as well? Yeah. And I think it's good also to kind of have regular check-ins with, you know, whoever your for, uh, 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 whoever your main point of contact is with uh, your client team. Just kind of, you know, how do you feel this is going? Just because I, I think uh, you can have different expectations like, what a discovery should be, what the goal is of it, um, you know, kind of what that should look like. And I think it's kind of good to just kind of have regular checkpoints. And pulse see checks. Our, yeah, just pulse checks. So, like, if we need to, like, adjust, like, um, just one uh, uh, client I remember working with, I think they were hoping there would be a lot more of an educational focus on the workshop. And we were just, you know, trying to ask questions and gather a lot of information. And I think they wanted to have a little bit more of an educational component to the workshops. Mm -hmm. And we were happy to do that, but like, you know, having that pulse check to kind of know that needed to be more of a focus, I think was really helpful. That we can pivot, yeah. yeah. That, and it's, it's so important. I mean, Jim, how many times have I done a pulse check mid mid-workshop <laughs> conversation. Three per session. Yeah. <laughs> but that's good. That's healthy. It's to make sure that, you it's know, people are engaged mm -hmm. and that they are getting what they need out of the session, too. Because it's not just about us getting what we need out of the session. It's about our clients getting yeah. what they need, too. Yeah. yeah, and the education, I think, probably should be part of a good discovery yes. process too just because like if you're in the agency world it's like yeah we do these all the time like we yeah. kind of know why we're doing the workshops and what we're trying to get out of them but a lot of other people are just kind of getting dropped into this process so they might experience this once this might be their first time experiencing it or they experience it once every five eight years when there's yeah. a big project in their department and yeah like mm -hmm. having that kind of educational point of like this is where we're going is and why we're doing this is really helpful. I just had an idea. You should do like a product owner boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, just to make this. All right, so uh, we're running out of time, but if you want to sign up for the product owner boot camp, come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, we do have only a few minutes left. I did want to open it up if you guys had any questions for our panel. I want to thank our panel for speaking and contributing here. But any questions about discovery, process? Uh, yeah, right here. Hold on, before we, before we answer, you have to say the question again. So, oh, sorry. Uh, you Go say ahead. the question, you're the moderator. So, uh, what is our opinion, or how do we feel yeah. mm -hmm. about virtual discoveries versus in person discoveries? From my perspective, I've done both, and I think there's pros and cons on both ends. Um, so, I'm trying to think where to start with this. Like mm -hmm. one of the things I like about doing the virtual is we have a little bit more uh, space in between to like process the outputs, prepare and come back. When we're doing in person, a lot of times it's like we will block out a week, we'll travel there in person, and we have to get through everything in that week, and it's just back to back to back meetings, and there's not really time for reflection. So like in person, I think it's nice. You have a little bit more uh, rapport, like you're there reading body language and like kind of that relationship building, I think stronger in person. But in terms of like being able to like really process the outputs, think, come back to the next workshop with a lot to uh, kind of follow up on. I kind of like doing virtual workshops better for that reason. Yeah, I think there's a sense of fatigue that comes with in-person workshops mm -hmm. where by the end of the day, you're not getting as valuable of information so you have to like really plan your sessions appropriately to make sure that like the end of the day is not content modeling like mm -hmm. that's not a good idea <laughs> um, and just making sure that you know again you're giving yourself the space you're doing your inventories and your materials intake and the things that you need prior to those in-person sessions that like maybe you would have the space as Nathan had said yeah. in a remote setting now remote setting, you also have people who are multitasking. So there's that. <laughs> and I think, you know, making sure that people are engaged, we often call on people during our sessions <laughs> to make sure that they are engaged um, and to, to get that valuable feedback. And we have our stakeholders in the background, like Jim, who will often be kind of pinging pinging me or, or someone else <laughs> to, <laughs> to make sure that like if someone has an opinion but they aren't ready to say it out loud that we can help facilitate 
-hmm. that thought and make them feel heard even if they have not said anything. So that's like another value to a mm -hmm. remote session where in person you can't really yeah. be doing in that. In person would not be viable for us of a project of this scale. There's 20 or so different workshop ceremonies. I've got so 20 different people. <laughs> we would never get them all yeah. organized and we would spend our whole budget just having you in the room. It just, it's, it's mm -hmm. not viable. There's a, a couple, I, I, um, I joined FFW during the pandemic, so I didn't have personal experience of it before, but I understand we, we did them more in person a little bit yep. before. Yep. And then the pandemic sort of educated everybody mm -hmm. about sort of how to, how to function collaboratively remotely. And I think a couple of things that we discovered that, that added value that we continue to do, even though we can be in person now that we yeah. want, is using a tool like Miro, yes. as yeah. opposed yeah, to say, like handwritten important. sticky notes, right? Because they're just much easier to like, the online whiteboarding, like it's much easier to work with those outputs afterwards to share them, yeah. to reorganize them, et cetera. Another thing that I've found really powerful for workshops, again, especially where not everybody feels empowered to speak up, or when you have a group where you have lots of senior folks and then some like mid and junior folks, is encouraging people, for example, to drop their thoughts and comments into the chat. Um, rather than speaking them yes. and more introverted or, or folks can, can do it that way and we'll collect those and put them on the board as we go. Um, so there are a lot of um, kind of, I guess, knock on like side benefits that we sort of discovered to doing them remotely. The, the times when I'd recommend being in person is when relationship building is really critical. Um, sometimes it's at the outset, sometimes that's at a, part, a point of the project where um, Maybe people just need to be in the same room in order to work together better. Um, or if you're dealing with um, issues of like very high complexity or of great delicate political importance, sometimes um, you really you there, sometimes there is no substitute um, to for building trust yep. than getting folks in a room. Um, but I think also yeah, in, in terms of the logistics of it, the practicalities of it, the flexibility of it, remote has been very powerful and has become our, our go-to yep. um, unless a client requests that we be there. I would recommend them, though, flying them in, them being anyone doing this work for you for discovery outcomes and those sort of mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, are we doing this or not ceremonies. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, the establishing trust, especially when it comes to sort of sharing findings and recommendations, yep. right? Yep. All right, well, so we're a little over time. Amanda and I actually have to get to our next session because they booked us back to back. Uh, but if you guys do have any additional questions, Janie and Jim and Nathan are right here if you want to come up and ask any questions. Uh, or if you want to uh, follow up with us at any time, please come up and provide your emails. It'd be great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.